Hello and welcome to the Shop Owner Roundtable powered by Full Bay. I am Jacob Finlay. We're here with Chris O'Brien. Hello everyone. And before we get started, quick disclaimer here. We're giving you general advice here for specific advice to your situation, professional, legal, accounting, and so forth. Make sure to consult a professional about your specific facts and circumstances. So I'm Jacob Finley, co-founder and executive chairman of Full Bay, here with Chris O'Brien. Hey, Chris. Hello, Jacob. Chief Operating Officer, COO of Full Bay. And we're really excited to welcome Jamie Irvine, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Heavy Duty Consulting Corporation. Hey, Jamie. Hello. Thanks for having me here. The power of technology. We're crossing borders. Jamie <laughs> is coming right. to us <laughs> from the great country of Canada. Uh, Jamie, quick introduction of yourself and uh, Heavy Duty Consulting Corporation, if you could. So I uh, started off in heavy duty parts right out of school, uh, worked for a remanufacturer for like 10 years and kind of really got an understanding of the parts industry and then went into distribution. And I think because of that manufacturing background and then going into distribution, I understood the importance of bringing manufacturing reps into the field and talking with uh, end users, with repair shops, with fleets. And that led me to launch a podcast called the Heavy Duty Parts Report just about five years ago, um, which led me to starting a consulting business because lucky episode number 13, I got my first client from one of my uh, guests on the show and he called me up after and said, Hey, I really could use your help on parts. And, um, you know, I said to him, I'm not really looking for a job. And he says, we'll start a consulting company and I'll be your first client. And so I did that on my own for some time. And, um, the last year we, we set up the heavy duty consulting corporation and we started hiring consultants. And now we have a, a small, but mighty team of nine people. And we are serving exclusively heavy duty parts, suppliers, distributors, and repair centers. Very cool. So uh, just high level, what are you guys doing for the repair shops specifically? Specifically, we're working with repair shops that want to transition from a repair center that buys parts locally from distributors and dealership groups to a parts and service company that wants to have a parts division that is seen by suppliers as a legitimate distributor partner and uh, helping them make that transition. Uh, that is the area that we focus on because we're parts people at the heart. Oh, gotcha. So in a way you're helping shops if they want to become distributors. Yeah, it's a to big extent, leap. It makes sense. Yeah, it's a big leap to go from being a, re a local repair center, even if you have multiple locations across, uh, you know, one state or a couple states. Uh, it's a big leap to do that and then actually be seen by suppliers as a legitimate parts distribution partner. And it seems, you know, quite simple on the surface because, um, you know, well, I just set up my parts uh, department and stock some parts and away we go. But there's a lot of barriers to that. And uh, we help uh, companies navigate through that and be able to really uh, position themselves correctly in the market. So suppliers see them as a legitimate option. We also do work for part for repair centers that have a parts department to help them to optimize their operations, um, even if they aren't uh, really going in that direction of, of parts distribution. Um, sometimes the, uh, the parts department itself needs some assistance and, and we will often, uh, offer consulting services that will help them in that regard as well. Gotcha. And by the way, before we jump into this, just to define terms, I had to learn this, um, early on too, but a supplier is somebody who makes the parts generally and a distributor is like a Napa O'Reilly, uh, fleet pride, whatever that takes the parts from the district, from the supplier and distributes them to shops. And so if you are a shop and you're buying parts directly from the manufacturer, of the parts, and then turning around and selling them over the counter or installing them in a way, you're already a distributor, right? Yeah, that's right. So, so you've got various levels of manufacturing suppliers. You have tier one that that supply parts to the original equipment manufacturers, like you know the Packar Group or Volvo Mac uh, International Freightliner. Uh, they often also have an aftermarket division where they sell parts to their through a distribution channel. Um, then you've got your your distributors and and OES dealership groups. So I, I kind of classify those that the one is a dealership, the other is aftermarket parts distribution, but they serve the same function to be a distributor of those parts to 
fleets, repair shops, mobile mechanics, owner operators. Uh, and then you have these repair shops that are independently owned and, and sometimes they do service only, sometimes they do parts and service, but that doesn't automatically make them a parts distributor. Is there like a threshold for millions of dollars in parts sold per month or per, per annually that would qualify you to move up or down in this ranking? I imagine you've got a, a, a playbook that you run to size up where, whether a shop's ready or not. Volume is certainly part of it, but um, channel conflict is is another part of it. And if you're seen by the suppliers as somebody who is the customer of their customer, then um, you know I've seen situations where fleets are buying in volume. You know they've got their own repair shop, or or a repair shop has so much volume going through their shop in parts, and the supplier still says no because that's the number one customer of someone like Fleet who, yes, sure, that repair shop in the local area maybe is doing more volume than anybody else in that area. But the supplier has to think about, well, if I upset someone like Fleet Pride or HDA Truck Pride or Truck Pro or one of the dealership groups like Rush Truck Center or MHC, I have to think about that nationally, not just regionally. Yes. So volume in itself is not the only precondition, although it certainly doesn't hurt if you move a lot of volume. Interesting. interesting. We could go on forever. Yeah. Well, one more, yeah. one more question. Yeah. This is a bit it's a, kind of interesting, like because we're getting into lowering cost of parts. Maybe to softball this up, but in this, uh, a lot of times we're talking to folks, and parts is you know it's a, it's it's one of the number one items in the shop that drives expense. And I often find that uh, a lot of folks are moving a vast amount of parts, and there's no program rebate programs in place. Do you help uh, put those in place or determine if the shop qualifies for rebate programs? Well, buying better is always part of the strategy, regardless if you're just a repair shop or if you're in the parts distribution game. And certainly there are rebate programs available through the big nationwide distributors that you can leverage. There's rebate programs that the suppliers offer. Uh, for example, when I was selling parts, uh, I worked for a Canadian division of Truck Pro at the time, and we leveraged a rebate program through our filter supplier and we were able to actually, it was interesting, when we sold the filter to the customer, it showed negative margin all month. And then at the end of the month, we reconciled with the rebate that was available, <laughs> and then it it gave us a positive margin. So there's all kinds of rebate games that uh, can be played. And depending on who you're buying the parts from will depend on what kind of a rebate program is available to you. But certainly you should be leveraging that in either case, whether you're a repair center and you do repair only and you just buy the parts that you install on your customer's vehicles, or if you're also in the parts and service side where you're where you're doing parts distribution. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Yes. We definitely ran into that uh, trying to get suppliers on board with our marketplace. A lot of them didn't want to talk to us because they were worried about potential competition with the distributors. And the problem with the distributors was most of them were not equipped, and I think this today to, to this day, most of them still aren't, to... Um, sell parts electronically. So anyway. Yeah. 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 yeah and, and, you know, that makes me think of, of some of the sales resistance that I ran into at times as well. And it would be like, um, I would go into a fleet and I would say to them, look at, you need to lower your, your total cost of operation by buying this higher quality product. And I want you to, to switch to this other brand. Uh, and we would lay out the math of how much that, that would improve the fleet's TCO and then they would look at like what they would lose in rebates on another category that had nothing to do with that. So let's say we were we were trying to upgrade them from cheap, uh, you know, offshore spring brakes to like a, a quality brand like MGM, and we could show them, hey, look, you're going to save like seven hundred dollars an axle, you know, by upgrading over a four year period if we factor in all the all the things. And they would say, that's great, but I'm going to, if I switch that brand away from who I buy other products from, like filters, I'm going to lose my rebate there. And the net effect of that would be actually uh, more cost to me. So you can win in the, you know, the battle, but then still lose the war because of, of mm -hmm. things like, like rebates on total volume of purchases. Yeah. 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 Totally cool. makes sense. A lot to talk about. We're not going to get to nearly yeah. everything that we could in the time allotted, but we've got about 45 minutes left. So um, here's what we're going to attempt to cover in 45 minutes, and we may not get to everything. Um, and once again, if you have any questions, hit the Q&A button. 
how lowering cost of operations for customers can be a game changer, how to overcome the challenge of parts identification, super difficult, and how to systematize the parts department of your shop. So let's jump into the first one, Jamie. Um, lowering to total cost of operations. So in your experience with Truck Pro there in Canada, uh, how, what's, if you're to go into a shop, random shop, what would be the first, I guess, two, three things that you're gonna look for to lower the cost of parts? So I think we have to look at it um, in a couple different ways. So when I, when I was selling parts, I, ultimately what I was trying to do is I was trying to give repair shop owners and, and the people who are doing the work, the information they needed to be able to communicate to their customers, the fleets and, and owner operators and end users that they were servicing equipment for, to give them the information they needed to be able to put a business case in front of that fleet and say, look, we need you on this friction material. We need this wheel end products. We need to combine these together because it's going to extend your warranty. We want you on this, this filter program. Um, you know, we're going to, we're going to take you off of these, these cheap, low cost uh, air components, and we're going to get you on high quality components that are going to last longer. And it was all about trying to get them to buy not the not forget price get people to stop thinking about purchase price and look at the actual cost of a low performing part versus a high performing part and if you can get like your customers heads around that then yes you know ideally what you are actually doing is you're you're getting your customer to spend more on parts on the purchase price but to get that benefit in the long run and so from a from a repair shop perspective that that creates it almost can create a little bit of a conflict because like the goal should be to lower the total cost of operation and reduce the amount of labor they have to spend um that that's the fleet's goal that's the the equipment operator's goal right the repair shop has to look at what they get to bill out for parts and the margin they get to make and what they get to bill out for for their labor rate and their shop time. And so that almost in, in the, in, you know, when I was selling to repair shops that all always kind of created that little bit of a feeling of conflict. But what I've always found is, is that for the repair shop, your goal should be the, to look at the total value of that customer, the lifetime value of that customer. And so, yeah, you can sell them like a cheap part that's low, that's low cost to you. Um, you can make some good margin on that. But if that customer is like changing their, those parts every six to 12 months, they may eventually just say, you know what, I'm going to go to a different shop. Right. So, so, so that's, that's where you get these conflicting ideas around lowering cost of operation. And you've got to yeah. try to find something that works for you as a repair shop. And ultimately you should be looking at keeping that customer for, and their lifetime value to you, not just the job I'm working on today. Yeah. So it sounds like it's the, uh... So the first thing you do is this principle. Uh, when I when I lived in Austria, they have a saying for this. It's teurer ist billiger. It's basically expensive is cheaper. And Chris, you like to say all yeah. the time, no matter what you do, you'll always end up paying full price. Right. Well, we used so to say, pay, pay me now or pay me later. Yeah. yeah, pay yeah. Me now, pay me so later. that's a Penny that's a true, kind of foolish. That's a true <laughs> principle. It really like it exhibits yeah. itself over and over again. So you're saying you go into the shop and make sure their relationship with the fleet is such that they're having these conversations yeah. about. Like you said, the goal ultimately for the fleet is total cost of ownership, maximizing uptime, minimizing downtime, yeah. lower, obviously. Lower and cost per mile, all of that. It all that, yeah, That's their goal. Which is a holistic view of things. It's not like part by part. It's like, what's the whole strategy for quality of parts? You buy a toaster from Walmart, you're going to have to buy another one in three months, right? So, or yeah. you can spend a little bit more. Right. Yeah, and I think as some some fleets, if you're hauling freight, the the truck's making money, so you need uptime. A lot of you know when I was in private fleet, that's we cared about uptime, and then to Jamie's point, you would look at the data of the parts and what were the repairs that was were cycling through, and what was the cadence at which they were cycling through, and you could identify you know maybe you know reefer units, you're specking a cheap battery and you're replacing them every. 18 months. And so yeah, yeah. by a simple battery change, putting an upgraded battery, um, although it costs you a little bit now, um, one load, the loss of one refrigerated load just far eclipses right. that short-term 
expense versus the long term, which I, I like uh, what you're saying, Jamie, with the basically the lifetime value of this customer and the full impact and meaning of these decisions. So Jamie, how does that, so I get it that that's going to help the fleets ultimately if you're putting higher quality parts in, even though they cost more, they're gonna have to swap them out less, there's fewer breakdowns, fewer lost loads and so forth. Um, how does that decrease the shop's operational cost? Well, I mean, if you buy a part and you're able to sell it at margin, right, a, a specific margin, the more you spend on the part, the more margin you can make theoretically. Where that becomes an issue is then you might have customers, and and this was always a frustration of mine. I would I would convince people of the the value of this this thought process behind lowering total cost of operation, and like for a year or two, you know, they'd be buying like higher quality friction material, and we got to mark it up more and make more margin on that. And then somewhere some something would happen, maybe the economy changes or the company starts to underperform, and all of a sudden price pressure becomes a thing, and it's almost like people forget. Um, these lessons that they've learned the hard way in the past, and all of a sudden they want to buy. The, you know, hey, listen, if you don't lower your um, your price on on a brake job to me, I got to go somewhere else. And it's like the only way you're going to get cheaper parts is if you buy parts with less performance characteristics. That's the only way to lower the cost of parts, right? And so there's always the margin game that you have to have to play. And that's where I think as a repair shop, you have to have this, if you're selling the right parts to your customers long-term, that's going to be good for your business. That's going to guarantee ongoing business with them. And on the flip side of that, you do have to work your network of suppliers to be able to leverage the volume that you do have and get the best possible deals because you have a margin that you have to maintain. And with like right now in an inflationary period, everything is going up. The suppliers costs have gone up, your costs are going up. Um, and, and there's only so much you can pass on to the end user. So, so there is this push pull and and this tugging back and forth bet between these two places and it it's not an easy you know if it was easy everybody would just do it and it wouldn't be a problem <laughs> uh it's it's a real challenge uh, yeah. the longer the timeline the harder it is to maintain these kinds of approaches because of the the changes and and the you know the pressure that gets put on all of us yeah, Jamie, uh, so so most shops will use a uh, graduated markup scale so maybe you know as the cost of that part goes up, the markup, maybe it hits, you know, that kind of point where the markup there's goes limits. down. Action but points. so yeah, there's limits. It seems like um, an, a, a compelling thing, like there's a lot of other benefits to having a closer re relationship and a higher trust relationship with your customers, the fleets. I mean, to the extent that you are truly helping them lower the cost per mile and so forth, um, it builds up trust, right? And yeah. that's another principle. Like the higher the trust, the faster things can get done. The more they're comfortable with you, maybe having like a higher pre-authorized limit for getting repair work done and so forth. And right. just right. the the back and forth is so much easier when there's a high trust relationship. So, and the um, it, the volume of customers that you can then have can go up as well because your reputation yeah. goes up, right? Yeah, and, and so, maybe the mix the mix of higher margin PMs goes up higher with that customer because you're doing fewer you know, unscheduled repairs and, yeah. and you're right. You can bring more customers into the fold because you're not spending all your time replacing that part that goes out every three months instead of lasting. We, we have a topical question, right? Yeah. Like hitting home, uh, Shay is, you know, like they're trying to do this, what we're describing here. And they're running into issues where there's a third party involved with the approval process. And we know all the brands out there and the names yeah. um, where, you know, there's these limits of $500 or, you know, there's a third party representing the fleet and if there's not a restriction on the cap, they're 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 saying, hey, I can get this repair done for 300 bucks cheaper, and they're basically yep. expecting a quality part at a discounted part rate, like a, an inferior part rate. Yeah. How do you manage that when you have one of those third party vendors in the relationship where they're ba they're somewhat beating you down on price, and they're not looking at it from quality; they're just running averages uh, based on a repair, and they don't really care about the brand, uh, you know. Bendix or whatever on on the job. Yeah, to, to the degree that you can explain to them the actual cost, uh, you might be able to have some success. Um, when I was in in part sales, 
there was just some customers that operated in a certain way and you have to operate within the rules and it it limits your ability to do this. And so I think that's where you have to really develop your ideal customer profiles and understand like which customers are we trying to do the most, like more business with, right? And there's like necessary evils that you have to deal with in, in any business. Um, and, and to me, that's one of them, because if you, if you don't have the ability to communicate the actual cost of what, of, of the decision, this third party is recommending to the end user, um, that, that severely limits you. And there's probably not a lot of ways around that. So you have to just understand what that is. And I mean, that's why in the parts game, the only reason a good, what we call a good, better, best product range exists is not because that's actually what is the right thing to do, but it's the reality. And as a parts guy, I'll tell you right now what our mentality is. When someone beats us up on price and they don't, they, they demonstrate by their choices, they don't actually care about lowering total cost of operation. We sell them the cheapest part we can find and make margin on it. And it's like, well, that's the game. So if that's the game you want to play, I'm not going to lose the sale. I'm going to sell you that part, but I'm going to tell you right now, here's exactly what's going to happen. So it's, it's very tough. Um, when you don't have, when you have the ability to sit down with the the person who's specking the product and, and really that's where you can kind of get around that third party. If the fleet has spec things correctly. And that's why I do a lot of work. I don't work with fleets so much, but I do a lot of work educating them because they need to have their specs in place. They need to do this work to understand what the TCO is when they buy product A versus product B so that they can empower the third-party providers they use and say, look, this is my spec, so don't sell me any of that cheap stuff because yeah. I know it doesn't work. So yeah. it's it's not one th it's not one thing that the repair shop can do. It's it's a combined effort of the parts suppliers doing their part, the repair centers doing their part, the fleets doing their part, and so there's just some customers who who just don't care about this stuff. And you have to understand who they are and put them in that box. And you're just looking for customers who do. Yeah. You know, on this note, one of the things we're, you know, we're talking about lowering, lowering the cost of operations. Parts is one component. And, you know, if you're experiencing rework or warranty issues and you're having to cover that for the labor because you're selling inferior yep. parts, you, you, you know, there's other costs involved. So you might get into a situation where you're going to go ahead and buy a higher quality part, but you're not going to have as much rework. You're going to get that longer cycle time and the ability to scale and do more repairs. So I do think that as we go through some of this stuff, you have to look at all of your operations costs and start factoring in warranties, rework, et cetera. And then even now more than ever, are your techs effectively being utilized? I was just looking at a bunch of KPIs of some very large customers of ours they're really honing in on the technician utilization being at 90 plus percent, meaning they have plenty of work for the technician. They're not standing around waiting for work, et cetera. And then they're going after the efficiency side where if they pay a technician 40 hours, they bill 40 hours. And right. I think that's where you can balance some of this, where your shop just might have a standard where you just won't put certain aftermarket or certain lower quality parts um, just just for the sake of the rework and, and and the quality of the repair, and you'll save it. Well, you'll save it in labor. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, the saying in manufacturing is quality doesn't cost; it pays. There you go. Right. It always makes you more yeah. money. Well, just running down the list, Jamie. Um, I want to make sure we get through as many I, as these. There as There was we can. one thing about operations I wanted to talk about. I just sure. want to make this point. When you've got like repair shops, have to think about: Do I use my local suppliers as satellite warehouses? And do I keep my total cost of operation lower because I'm not having to put out cash to stock product, right? So there, that's one strategy. Then the other strategy is, well, if I'm going to inventory product and I'm going to put that on the shelf and have it here at my shop, what is the cost to do that? And that has to be factored into your purchase price on product as well. So you can't just look at the purchase price of product A versus product B. You have to also look at the strategy you're using and what is the true total cost to you? Because right. if that part has been on the shelf and you, that means you put cash out 30 days ago and you've held that part in, in inventory, even only 45 days, that, de that depleted your cash flow as a business. And, yeah. and in the end, when you sell it, did that actually, you know, because you can look at the margin of the part, 
your purchase price of what you sold it to your customer for, but you can't forget to calculate those other costs associated with carrying that part in inventory. And that's the game that I think repair shop owners need to really understand as well. So if fleets need to understand what the total cost of buying a part and installing on their truck is, repair shops need to understand what the cost of stocking and holding that part is in relation to selling it to their customers. Yeah, the rule of thumb that we've always used is 15 to 20% annualized carrying cost for carrying inventory. Yep. And, and as- it's it's really dangerous because the person in the shop who's in charge of purchasing parts has the ability to financially cripple the operation because they could suck up all the cash available, all the operating capital available and put it on shelves, which then depletes at, you know, 20% annually negative when my, return when my daughter gotta, was born i was i was sleep deprived and i accidentally ordered 300 of something we only sold 30 a year of and it was such a huge <laughs> dollar amount per unit that it um the the boss <laughs> he came to me and he says jamie um if you don't sell this in the next 60 days not only are you out of a job you've you've effectively shut down our entire company that was the time period <laughs> in my life i discovered i could sell because i sold all 300 of them in 60 <laughs> days <laughs> I'm sure it would have helped them to have those during COVID. I'm sure it would have worked. Oh out. yeah, this was like 25 yeah. years ago, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know but just shows it just illustrates the point though of of how important it is to make sure that you're buying appropriately yeah. and you're thinking about all of the aspects of your business, especially cash flow. You got to have yeah, cash to sure. run a business. You got to have guidelines in place, standards in place, and everybody does need to understand the whole carrying concept, the, the carrying cost concept, because uh, one of the things that uh, we may or may not get to is the concept of you know bulk order options. You know, if you're going to make a bulk order, you should only make the bulk order for a part that turns quickly. And right. yep. in Full Bay, you can run your uh, uh, inventory turnover report to see which parts turn over faster or slower. Those are the ones you want to target for bulk ordering, right? And and by the way, I mean let's talk about that. So Jamie, what do you recommend for shops if they want to get into bulk ordering those high turn parts? Where do they turn? Um, how do they source parts other than from dealers? Maybe is there a way to go directly to suppliers sometimes? And see, this uh, this what's, is the, what's your advice the tricky there? part. It looks it looks obvious, right? Like, hey, if I call up a supplier and I I cut them a PO for a container load of this one part number, surely they're going to want to sell that to me. And the answer is probably not, because um, if they if they hurt a national distribution agreement or even a regional one that's multi state, um, that that distributor might be buying $40 million a year in parts from them. And you're offering them a PO, you might think it's a huge PO for 300 grand. They're not going to sacrifice the $40 million in parts orders that they get from that company over, you know, each year for a $300,000 container shipment to you. So channel conflict is what you have to consider there when trying to bulk buy. Um, If you're going to buy through the distributor, the bulk buy, there's certainly an opportunity there to to leverage that that PO with your distributor or your dealership group. But more than likely, you're going to have to uh, get a salesperson who understands that game and is going to have the ability to go back to the supplier and negotiate. And sometimes your local sales guy is limited or gal is limited in how much they can do that because there's procurement departments that are buying at the DC level that are then selling to the to the distributor. It's all one company, but they do operate the DCs and the and the stores as as two entities. And there's margin in between those. And so I've actually run into issues where I wasn't able to get a deal through because procurement was like, no, that's screwing up a larger deal I'm trying to negotiate with this supplier for next year's season of you know product whatever. So on the surface, it just looks like, hey, if I cut a big PO, I should be able to get a better deal. But there's all these conflicts that come up that have to be considered. And you have to kind of understand where you sit in the supply chain and leverage what you can around you. Yeah. And I love your point too. If if you're doing any kind of bulk buying, you have to be able to see the path to every single one of those items sold. Yep. We were recently at a customer that had, you know, racked uh, the whole ceiling full of hoses. And so we had rubber hoses that had been up there for over a year, just rotting. So if there's not a path to those sales, it, there, there's actually no win at the end of the, uh, at the end of the bulk buy game, right? You, yeah, you, you absolutely. Literally, and, and then you start taking losses or we had a good, some good friends of ours uh, based out of Texas. Um, they 
you know, parts person brought in way too much and they ultimately got to the point where they were like, you know what, it's actually more beneficial to take the 20% restocking fee and send it back yeah. and negotiated that down just to get the cash back in the bank to start operating. So uh, super critical to be very careful and have a path because at the end of the day, you're paying for parts and you're marking them up. And I think you had a rule, Jamie, in one of our conversations, 30% margin is the is the rule. Anything <laughs> below 20% mar margin as a parts company and you're losing money. There so, you go. so because because once you factor in carrying costs, delivery costs, all of those things that go along with it, um, you're just losing money. So we always, you know, we were always saying, okay, yeah, this is a good customer and they buy in lots of volume. But if margin across the board falls below 25%, we're getting dangerously close to just breaking even. Now, again, this is where the parts game gets interesting because you might have a procurement officer who works at your DC who says that's okay because we're making 17% between the DC and the retail location. And as long as you guys don't lose money, the company is happy with that. Go ahead and sell it at that margin. And I always said the same thing as a sales guy, only if my commission isn't based on margin alone. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot a more guy, to the parts say, game than people realize. As a finance guy, I would say every commission should be based on margin. <laughs> yeah, it so, should be, unless you tell me to sell it at that low margin and then yeah, you're not yeah, willing no, to pay no, me. That's I, not I my it. fault. <laughs> and by the way, I, uh, I sp oh, go ahead, Chris. I was oh, going to take us to the next one. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So I spent a year working in a shop before we launched sales at Full Bay, and that was really eye opening to me. And I did the best I could, but it's not my background. And I tip my hat to everybody that deals with not just the part side, but all aspects of the shop. But I remember one day our uh, main parts guy had to take off, and I was like, oh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to fill in for him. He asked me to, like, how hard could it be? And I was like immediately lost trying to find yeah. parts for a Waltco lift gate, I think. And, right. uh, th th thumbing through this dusty book, I had no idea what I was doing. And I'm sure I was the absolute least experienced parts person in the United States that day. Like <laughs> nobody would have plugged me in, in the right mind. But it really gave me an appreciation for how hard it is to identify the right parts and then of course sourcing them. So I mean, what 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 tips do you have for, especially given maybe there are some online tools avail available for this, Jamie, for somebody who needs help doing parts identification? Because it's so crucial. Yeah. A big problem with parts ordering is ordering the wrong part in the first place. So totally. Wh what would you say to shops in terms of help on identifying parts? If you have a dedicated parts person, you need to make sure that they understand how to identify a part. Um, that is kind of like that whole thing of like, I can show you, or I can fish for you, or like you give you one fish, or I can show you how to fish, and then you can fish for life, right? I remember when I was starting in parts, this was back in the days of paper catalogs, and um, I would come and say to my mentor, like, what's the part for the spendix? Like, or what's the part number, sorry, for the spendix part? And he would always say the same thing. Do you want me to tell you the part number, or do you want me to show you how to find it? And I always chose, show me how to find it, because I think if you can learn and understand, like, how to think about identifying a part that's that's like a critical piece to being a good parts person and that unfortunately you need a good mentor and you need somebody who who knows what they're doing to kind of like teach you those fundamentals today there's a lot of great tools so in my day um you know it was paper catalogs and then we we had fleet cross and that was pretty much the only cross, you know, uh, parts cross software that was available at, at that time. And slowly the manufacturers started putting out um, different cross reference and, and cataloging online. Um, you know, a Google search is a very dangerous thing. But I want to give you, I want to give everybody listening some insight into how bad it actually is when it comes to data. Because when we moved away from the catalogs into uh, everything being digitized. The thought was that we should be able to update things more quickly and that the information that's available, especially if it comes from a supplier or manufacturer, should be accurate. Here's the reality. Remember I said there was tier one manufacturers with aftermarket divisions, and then there's like tier two manufacturers that are just straight aftermarket, and they're just copying whatever the tier ones make after those trucks come out. They get a hold of those parts, they make copies of them, and, and that's kind of how it works. I was shocked to find out that even tier one manufacturers with their OEM connections had aftermarket manufacturing of parts where they were manufacturing the same part 
under two different part numbers and they didn't know it. It's like, how is that possible? But here's why. The OEM side of the business, if you're going to be involved in OEM and you have an aftermarket division, those two divisions pretty much have to be siloed. They're not allowed to share information with one another. So the aftermarket manufacturer who's making these parts, you know, they might make one under like a Mac Volvo part number, and then they might make that same part somewhere else under one of the aftermarket brands part numbers and never do the two talk. Right. And so that, that, that actually does happen. Now it's not like tens of thousands of part numbers, but it shows you like how complicated it gets. Because as soon as you have a truck that gets specced one way, and then another truck gets specced another way, it creates a variation. And those variations continue on down the line until those trucks are all manufactured and rolled off the, the line, the production line. But then it gets worse because owner one sells to owner two, he re-rigs the truck for a different application or a different vocation and specs start to change, right? So parts identification is a real challenge. And I think that it's really important for repair shops to understand where we are with demographics in the parts industry. We have like 70% of our people over the age of 55, we have a very small percentage of people between the ages of 35 and 55, and we have like 2% of our parts people are under the age of like, let's say 30. There is just a demographic cliff when it comes to parts identification and knowledge that we are going through over the next six years, because all of those older ones are going to be retired roughly by 2030. And so like I said, because there's so many issues with the quality of the data at some point, I think repair shops are going to have to just take ownership of this themselves. And one of the things that you can think about is every in every part you've ever bought, you knew exactly what truck it went on. But you never captured that information. And that kind of data is worth its weight in gold. I work with suppliers every single week that their number one challenge is how do we get reliable data out to our customers. And, no, we and have that data. <clears throat> it, is, well, yeah, it is so difficult to get data. And lots of people say we have that data. But then when you actually analyze the data, you find out how much, how much of that data is corrupted. So you have to be very careful with the statement, we have that data. Because if the manufacturers themselves don't even always know, how is a distributor or, or a repair shop be expected to know, right? You know what's interesting well, is well, we um, we know because the work order is going into full bay. That's right, and they're yeah. putting the part on it with the VIN tied to it and so forth. It's just a matter exactly. of uh, coming through that. But yeah, you know but, what's but that's my is, that's my point about that. As a repair shop, you didn't even realize that you were actually the source of truth that the whole industry needs the data that you have. So it's interesting yeah. that Full Bay has been you know, recording that. I, I really think the future of parts identification has to be tied back to the historical parts installation and, and purchasing that has been done successfully. And if we you can know, digitize that and make that available, that's hugely powerful. It's the same thing on the labor side, Jamie. Um, so we rely on motor labor guides. You know, mm -hmm. It's a standard uh, that helps you get paid by third parties and so forth. But ultimately, the shops are the ones that really know how long stuff takes. And yep. um, anyway. Yeah. Well, well yeah. I was just going to say the, the one of our number one competitors, believe it or not, is pen and paper. So when you go and you, someone says, well, for Full Bay, who's your number one competitor, pen and paper? And this conversation of parts identification, we run into countless folks that might only be using QuickBooks or they're still on pen and paper mm -hmm. and they don't have a way to tie that back out to a component or a system. And I think, you know, whether we're the solution for, uh, for all of the shops out there or there's others, um, I think it's time now that everybody move to a software platform and start standardizing this because... Yep. If you do have the service orders and you can tie it back to the VINs and you can recall those repairs or you can recall that part history as you're uh, performing another repair, um, it makes it much easier for just about anyone to call and order up the part for a specific make model year, especially if it's a private fleet that you, you do business with. Mm -hmm. And kind of that, that idea of uh, trying to use older uh, antiquated systems or, I mean, God forbid, pen and paper Sure, it works, but it's not going to scale. And you just might find out sooner than later when the parts person goes on vacation or retires, just how critical all that would, 
that information is if you just had it in a system that you could you could use and leverage. Hey, I, hey Jamie. Yeah. Um, so uh, I wanted to move on to this point here about uh, marketing strategies, and it seems like your position is that you'd like to see shops that aren't currently selling parts, say, over the counter or acting as a quasi-distributor on some level. Your position is basically, hey, this is a this is a pretty reasonable profit center that you could create in your organization or revenue stream. Um, you ought to set this up. I can show you how to do it. You do that with your consulting firm and so forth. So if a shop is selling some parts and maybe wants to expand that side of the business, what... I guess what are some pragmatic steps they can take to to get the word out and and by the way w- what we've seen is typically when shops are selling parts over the counter they're not necessarily trying to become Amazon right or compete yeah. with Amazon and shipping parts all over the country it's more uh, selling parts in the local area um, so anyway what are your thoughts there Jamie marketing strategies what's the geographic footprint typically that these sales are happening. Well, I, I think you should start with um, what we call Tam Sam Som, so your total addressable market, your serviceable addressable market, and your obtainable market based on the infrastructure that you have in your business. Like This is a critical part of the analysis that has to be done before you start throwing a lot of cash behind setting up a parts room or hiring parts people or getting delivery trucks or starting to buy inventory. Like You got to really understand who is in your market and and where your opportunities are and so um you know i have i have one client and they went out of their way to set up all their service shops in areas where there was no parts stores and very you know much smaller rural areas why did they do that because they had a long-term plan of also becoming a parts distribution company and so right now as we go to help them set up their parts distribution company the the relationship with the suppliers is so much easier because we can say look the location is here. It's outside of the AOR of uh, of all of your distributors, or at least it's it's not right in the middle of it where you're going to be going up against existing distribution that you already have in place, supplier. Um, why not sell parts to us, right? So getting in the parts game is not a, it, you know, it's an expensive proposition. There's a lot of infrastructure and a lot of capital that is required to do it correctly, to actually succeed in becoming uh, uh, viewed by suppliers as a legitimate distributor. And so it always starts with that analysis of your market. And you should do that anyway, as a repair shop, even if, even if you're only kind of contemplating getting into the parts game, you need to know where your opportunities are for service. And if you're going to build a strategy for your business, you have to be able to map that out and clearly see where, where your value proposition actually creates some sort of differentiating thing for, for the customer. Because without that, the only thing we're ever going to talk about is price. Where, where would you go to get this information? Let's say that maybe I couldn't afford your services, right? I don't even know what the services cost. Um, if I were just going to take the initial steps, uh, where could I start or where would I stop as a, start as a shop owner to do this research? Because well, I some just people, would just go to Google, right? Yeah, <laughs> some, some people use like RigDig to find out where the equipment okay. is, is registered. Um, and that's not a, a totally terrible place to get started. But you also know your market. There's no, like, if you're going to do it on a smaller scale and you're going to do it on a regional level, get out and go see your customers. Go find out where they are. Find out where where the growth is going to be. See, like, you know, um, when I was selling in Vancouver, I was looking at, uh, which is, you know, a large metropolitan area, very similar to the C- the city of Seattle. You know, I was looking at projects around construction, bridge construction, road construction, um, you know, new, new, um, like, like where the, where's the, the residential buildings going to be? Cause that's what drove the fleet activity and vocations. Right. But now I live in Northern Alberta. So when I was selling parts, it was all about oil and gas and, and logging and mining. So I wanted to know where the, where the, where the next exploration was going to be for, for mining rights and, and what was going to happen in the logging industry and, and things like that. So there was no shortage of just getting out, driving around, talking to fleets, talking to your customers, finding out what's going on in your area and being able to try to understand like, where do you, where do you spend your money? As a parts guy, I always wanted to find out like, okay, repair shop or fleet, where are you spending your money? Who do you buy parts from? 
give you know, and they're not going to tell you to the penny, but they'll give you, usually if you ask them, they'll just give you uh, ranges. Like, well, I spent about 40% with the dealership and 60% with the distributors. Okay. Well, which distributors? Well, I buy from Fleet Pride, you know, Fleet Pride and I buy from Truck Pro. And sometimes I buy from one of the auto car uh, places because we also service pickup trucks and you can kind of get a feel you ask enough of those questions to your regional market, you start to see like the Venn diagram just starts to appear and you start to find these underserved little areas that nobody's ever given a lot of focus to. And I always say the riches are in the niches. You got to find those little (laughs) spots in the market where there's some underserved customers and go and give them something that they want. That's that, this is like the beginning point. There's obviously a lot of work that goes behind that. But that understanding of your local market is critical to build a strategy. Now, if you're going to go larger than that, you should probably get a company like mine to do a proper market investigation for you. And we have resources that a local repair shop or or even a repair shop with five or six locations just would never be able to access. And we do market investigations all the time for companies that are trying to get this information. You know, now we had something come up earlier. Uh, we were just moving on to a topic, but uh, uh, Peter was asking, what's your feeling about being part of a buying group like HDA Truck Pride? Yeah, so yeah. so buying groups um, are a great way to just leapfrog into the business and get access to all kinds of resources that would take you so much time and effort to to get on your own independently. You know, you have to look at the buying group. So HDA Truck Pride is a non nonprofit buying group. Like everything that they that they generate in the terms of revenue from the fees of their members gets reinvested back into the buying group, uh, into in in into things like their new online university and and other resources to help you be better. Um, Vipar, for example, is a for-profit buying group. So their model is completely different. There's not that many groups out there anymore. There's really only a couple left for heavy duty. But um, you know, I, I definitely think buying groups are a are a great way to to get in and to accelerate the uh development of your company. Here's here's some inside information that you guys might want to think about. If you're ever contemplating on getting involved in mergers and acquisitions and growing your repair business and your parts business through acquisition, there are a ton of independent owners that are members of those buying groups that are going to be up for sale in the next few years because they're aging out, right? They're the older baby boomers that are basically ready to exit. And there's a lot of businesses that don't have a good succession plan in place. And that's another service that we offer is we work on the on the mergers and acquisition side. We're now partnered with Notre Capital um, and, and we're able to help companies who want to grow through, through acquisition. And let me tell you, there are dozens of really good quality companies that um, are going to be up for sale. And not all of them can be bought by Fleet Pride and Truck Pro, right? There, there's limits to how many of companies those those uh, consolidators can buy because they might already have a location in that area and they're not going to buy another one. Um, so that's a great opportunity for people who want to grow through acquisition, just to plant a seed that something you might want to start thinking about. Yeah, and that's a way to get a distributorship, basically. Hundred um, percent. Very easily, it would come along with the acquisition. Yeah. I would say too, if if you're not using shop repair or shop management software today, uh, and mm-hmm. you're doing pen and paper, if you're trying to go do mergers and acquisitions, it's going to be a tough haul. You but if you are, are just add another location, it's it's right, all good. Putting right. the processes, being able to see things remotely, scale, get the data that um, Jamie referred to, start standardizing that parts identification as you are scaling and leveraging uh, different resources and looking to mergers and acquisitions, then definitely reconsider your position on only running QuickBooks or pen and paper. It's probably yeah. going to be yeah. short lived. <laughs> yeah, and and here's 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 exactly like I'll, I'll lay out the exact strategy that I would do if I owned a repair shop and I wanted to grow through acquisition. I would work with Full Bay, and I would get my business like a well oiled machine, and then I'd go buy companies that haven't done that yet because now you're in a position to replicate what you've done in your shop in multiple locations so you can use the it's not franchising but you use the franchise model right i got the systems in place my my company is running like a well oiled machine i'm now going to grow through acquisition and and these companies because they haven't done that they need me 
they need someone yeah. like me to come along and buy them and use economies of scale and use systemization to upgrade. And that's where the value comes, right? Because yeah, you there's take plenty a of shops here, out there, plenty of shops out there like that. Good yeah. customers in place, yep. running on pen and paper. Uh, you could go in and buy it at a fair price for what it's doing then and then uh, upgrade it and processes. then you can sell the whole thing. Yeah, last webinar, uh, anyone who's watching this who wants to learn more about it, Peter Cooper was out here. They literally just bought four shops using the same model that JB just stated right here. Uh, got a shop running on full bait, very successful. And then they started acquiring shops, uh, put together an infrastructure. It's rinse and repeat. And he's literally, and it's so easy for him because he's installing full bait at every single shop. He knows how the system works. Every tech runs the same way. Efficiency metrics are the same way. It's very easy for him to manage and scale. And then if he's listening, shout out. I showed up to the office for the uh, first time in a while, and he sent me a bottle of bourbon from his hometown. <laughs> Tennessee? Is that what yeah. 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 So in Illinois, so we were oh, talking no. bourbon, and he sent me a bottle. I'll be damned. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we will have to uh, have that when we're at Diesel Connect. Well, uh, yeah. It's coming up. I, Jamie, I know you're going to be uh, speaking at Diesel Connect. So we're recording this in um, April 2024. Diesel Connect is going to be in uh, May of 2024, and I'm gonna show, we have a promo code, $100 off Diesel Connect, uh, last chance is the promo code. So if you wanna attend Diesel Connect, it's gonna be here in Phoenix, in the Phoenix area, uh, Chandler, Arizona, May 6th through 8th. Jamie, you're speaking, I'm speaking. Jamie, give us a preview of what you're gonna talk about there. Yeah, so we're gonna really pull back the curtain on the state of heavy duty parts in the aftermarket right now in 2024. And we're gonna go pretty deep. We're gonna do like an inch uh, wide and a mile deep on what it actually takes to transition from a repair only company to a true parts and service company that that is viewed by suppliers as a distributor. So we're really going to go deep on that. And um, I'm also going to share a lot of my personal story because, you know, heavy duty people are the backbone of society. And uh, to be heavy duty as a person, you have to be resilient. And uh, I'm going to share some of my story to show you that um, it isn't always a straight road to success. But if you are resilient and determined and you work hard, and you never give up, uh, you can achieve amazing amazing things. So uh, I'm really looking forward to having the opportunity to speak at your event. It'll be my first time and um, it, I've got it on the calendar and I can't wait to get there. And so people will be able to meet you in person. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Jamie Irvine in person. All yeah. right. We're going to compliment his session with uh, a group out of Ohio that's uh, selling north of a million a month in parts and over counter sale. About 30% of their business now, they've, they've transformed from a shop to just doing uh, repairs to 30% of their revenue is now by counter sales. And so there's a whole uh, module that we're gonna be going through uh, to complement what Jamie's speaking about, um, what the infrastructure, the way that they're running it, and their goal is to be 50-50. They want 50% of their revenue to come through repair and 50% yep. to come through counter sale. And they're, I think they're at seven locations now uh, following uh, Jamie's, Jamie's advice. That model that he's describing here they're actually executing it, and we're going to unpack it right there at Diesel Connect. Yeah. So if you're awesome. thinking about doing that, maybe maybe you will, maybe you won't. But if you want to take a hard look and uh, run the numbers and see what the risks are and and the opportunities, then that would be really good. I got one more one question for you, uh, Jamie. What is some advice for someone? Just came in from Nicholas. Uh, what is some advice for someone who just got promoted to parts manager? Cool. First time parts manager. Didn't so, clarify, but I'm going to assume. Okay, I'm, assume, yeah. I'm assuming so. Um, so if you are managing a parts counter with parts people, the, the knowledge that those experienced parts people have as a manager, you've got to get that knowledge out of their head, that tribal knowledge, and you've got to get it down into the, the hearts and minds and souls of your younger parts people. So I would make that an absolute priority. Um, I also would work very closely with my leadership to really understand the larger financial objectives that the leadership and ownership of my company has so that I could align my part strategy to support those. And um, I think as a, as a third thing is I would start to look for recruiting people to my counter 
from unlikely places. And what I mean by that is that there are a lot of good people in your community, young people who are looking for a career, and they have no idea that the parts industry is a phenomenal industry to have a career in. And so I would be like, like, you know, someone uh, in sales always said, always be selling. If you're in management and you're looking to build out a, a great counter of people, always be recruiting. I think that's essential. <laughs> and I guess, I guess one of the last things I would say is getting parts into the hands of people quickly is the name of the game beyond like, obviously getting high quality, high performing parts into their hands is, is essential. But the speed to which your parts department can get those parts to your customers and the level of communication that you have with your customers is where you can differentiate yourself and win. Because let's face it, you're probably selling a lot of the same parts as the competitor. So how do you beat your competitors? You know, out deliver them, out communicate with them, make sure they know where those parts are, when they're going to be delivered, when the cores are going to be picked up. Don't uh, delay on warranties. Really, really focus on that service side because that's where those longstanding relationships come from. And that's what empowers your company to be able to have business development conversations in the future with your customers. All right. Yeah. Well, our guest on the round table has been Jamie Irvine, CEO of Heavy Duty Consulting Corporation. Thank you, Jamie. We look forward to seeing you in a few weeks here in Arizona. And uh, thanks a lot, Chris. That's also, all we have today. Just before Thank we you. go, just before we yep. go, can I can I plug the Heavy Duty Parts Report? So I have a podcast yeah. called the Heavy Duty Parts Report. It's at heavydutypartsreport.com. If you want to learn part strategies, you want to know what's going on in the parts industry, yes. go over there and please listen to our podcast. Heavydutypartsreport.com? Yes, it is. Yeah. Perfect. Right. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah. Awesome. We'll see you soon, Jamie. Thanks, thanks a lot, so much everybody. for having me. Bye. Bye.